Hello, everyone. I'm Freddie Clairvaux with Watch Fox News, a sponsor for the virtual production <clears throat> of the 42nd Annual Jubilee Festival of Black History and Culture, hosted by Historic Columbia and presented by Bank of America. This summer, we've witnessed a massive movement for Black Lives Matter across the country. And as we celebrate Black history and culture today, it's important to take a look at protests, these protests happening, and also the civil rights movement to see what we, where we've been and where we're going. And today, we'll get a chance to hear from activists then and now. I'm joined by Bishop Redfern II and Lawrence Nathaniel. Bishop Redfern was a political activist in the 1970s with the Columbia Group Blacks United for Action and is now a presiding bishop with the Ecumenical Church of Christ. Lawrence Nathaniel is the founder of the Black Lives Matter South Carolina and also the organizer of the I Can't Breathe March held on May 30th, 2020. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely, all right, so to kick things off, are you all familiar with each other's work? I'm a little familiar with bishops, um, you know, over the past couple of months. Um, so difficult for these young people to have history, but I'm very familiar with your work, and I'm very proud to even be on the same platform with you and oh, keep no. up the good work, after all. Black Lives Matter. Yes, and it's an honor too to be on um, the same panel with you as well um, in your work that you do in the community. Um, so yeah, I don't know how to pronounce the name of the actual church, so I'm not going to embarrass myself by doing that. <laughs> so speaking of that, so Bishop Redford, you know, um, talk to us about your activism in the 1970s. What exactly were you doing? Well, I have to go back a little further than that to 1968. Uh, I just spent my first year at the University of South Carolina, and I became black aware. Stokely Carmichael, Charles Hamilton came to our campus. Cleveland Sellers were, or, was organizing, and I joined what was then a loosely um, conflagration of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I was present at the Arnsberg Massacre. As a matter of fact, I was there when Skinny Red was shot, and Hamilton and Middleton were shot, and had to carry some people over to Claflin dorm. And so this notion of Black Lives Matter really mattered in Arnsburg, South Carolina. And we don't pay enough attention to that. But in the 70s, uh, I guess the last big demonstration I did was 50,000 people at the 1976 at the State House. And there were a number of Black people who were killed by policemen. Uh, the one who really made a difference was Lewis Calvin Hall, who was shot in his driveway by a highway patrolman who followed him home and as he got out the car murdered him. The one uh, where the three uh, young men were killed in Orangeburg. Then there were all kinds of police shootings all during my childhood. James Earl Dennis and a number of police officers. And so we were highly engaged and not committed or tied to anyone. And we used to have an expression, wanna wanna BB, we're gonna work a juju on you. Who will survive in America? A whole lot of black people and no crackers at all. But we were on the edge in our time and we are just so proud to see these young people who have picked up the same kind of torch and the same vigor and the same commitment and throwing away risk and getting out and doing a new thing. Wow, wow, okay. Um, and so um, Lawrence, um, how about you? For those who, you know, people here at Black Lives Matter and there's always, uh, we hear an issue or a difference. Um, what exactly is Black Lives Matter in South Carolina particularly? Um, particularly, our problems are not every other state's problems. Everybody's state has different issues, different policies that need to be changed here. Black Lives Matter here is more of a reforming our community and our police departments um, to build better trust, accountability, transparency, um, more training um, and having our community more involved um, with our government officials and bringing our younger people out on the streets as well so they can have their voices heard. Um, so that's what Black Lives Matter South Carolina is about, um, being that thorn on the side of our government official side. Um, so that way they won't fall asleep on us no more. And so Bishop Redfern, does that sound um, eerily similar to your days of activism? Well, that may be the cream on top of the cake. Um, we still have problems with housing and Black Lives Matter in housing. 
when we cannot get affordable housing, when we cannot get decent housing. Uh, before we protested because we were living in shotgun houses, poor housing, housing without plumbing. Now we're living in houses where the rents are through the roof and we can't afford actual housing. And so the, the struggle is the same. And as I have traveled over the country and the world, this notion of black lives having matter, meaning, and they said the matter as a technical term cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be killed. And so our people are being killed in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Mississippi. And, and when we think about the police are just an extension of the Trump mob, when we think that those people in Michigan with long arms going into the, the General Assembly, they've done this to us all of our lives, except when they came in our community and lynched us, they mutilated us, they castrated us, nothing has changed. And so this young man is taken forward and going and organizing our community and, and, and trying to be as graceful, as hopeful, as um, congenial as possible. But the raw truth remains that our lives are threatened daily. Every time a police car pulls behind me, I'm terrified. So when I think about Walter Scott, when I think about the Emanuel Nine, my life is constantly in danger. And I'm suffering from a post-traumatic, no, I'm suffering from present traumatic stress syndrome because we are still the most killed, the most hunted, the most arrested, the most accused. And so this young man has taken on a battle that we have fought in this country for 400 years. And, and he's doing a great job. And I, I'm just so glad that old people like me can sit on the bench and watch this young man go at it. They've had more demonstrations and caused more conflict and confusion than anybody in the last 10 years. So Black Bishop, Lives Matter. I, I'm just glad to be here with them. So Bishop Redford, you know, to that notion, you talked about policing. We like to have y'all. Some people may look at that and say, some people may say, you know, um, not all police are bad and then many police officers or law enforcement have made strides to be involved, better involved in the black community and they're not the same as before. What do you say to that? Um, I don't have a hog and I've never watched one, but if I had to put the two words together, I would say hogwash. Sheriff Lott, who's a friend of mine, just had to fire a sheriff deputy because he grabbed a black woman by the head and slung her. I, there's so much corruption in our police. Somebody said, well, let's look at the good police. It's not the good police that are killing us. And he said, well, when uh, he did that, the Lexington County Sheriff Department, the police there say, send them over our way. We have a position for him. And when you look at the number of people who are arrested, every white mass murderer with a weapon was brought in peacefully. They didn't shoot any of them, but all of us unarmed the police seem to have to shoot us. So, I mean, this whole notion of the sanctity of the police department is hogwash, and I've never washed a hog. And some people would ask me, have I own cattle? And they would ask me, does it have anything to do with bulls? And I'll say, no, it doesn't, because I can't say words like that. But we are constantly at unease because of the police. Training, they've had training for the last 50 years and yet they kill us. Organization, they've been organized for the last 50. What you can't get over is the racism in the police department. Systemic, systematic, and evil racism. What does that mean? That means that we become a target anytime we're involved. When I saw Blake get shot seven times in the back, I wanted to tell him never wear a white beater shirt again. Mm. So, Lawrence, you know, to that, we talk about police. I know that you mentioned with Black Lives Matter South Carolina, um, how you all want to kind of um, bridge that gap or come together. During the recent protests, you even brought the law enforcement to the table. It's so uh, what do you say to that notion about having law enforcement uh, be present? We have to have, we have to inundate our own selves at the table. Uh, that's the only way that we can actually get real change to happen um, is by actually interdating ourselves in there, by putting those activists like those from One Common Cause for on Richland County um, Citizens Advisory Committee. So that way they have a chance to see what goes on in the police department. Um, 
So it gives us that chance of opportunity to um, bridge that gap for communications and have people in there that the community trust to make sure that they hold our sheriff and our deputies to the fire, make sure that we are weeding out those officers who are bad um, and that we have transparency as well. Because even as Sheriff Lott said during his press conference, you know, they made a mistake. They, they, it was, it was a fault of their own of missing um, the paperwork and not properly going over the use of force. And that's one of the things I have to look at. In the past four years, Richland County use of force have risen. Um, in the past six years, um, Lexington County, as an African American, you're 31. 31% more likely of being pulled over are being use of force against you in Lexington County. Um, so the problems are still there, but they're still there with each individual officers. And yes, um, as the Bishop said, they have had training for so long, but yet they still kill us. So it goes back in a way that we have to remove our evil folks out of the police department. And there are some hog down evil people inside the police department across the entire state. And one of the things that Lawrence was talking about there was actually a recent deputy who was fired from the Richland County Sheriff's Department for um, an appropriate um, behavior or interaction with uh, someone who was in his custody. And we're explaining that because we know that this is virtual and a lot of people outside of South Carolina may be watching this. So Bishop, to you, one of the final questions here, you know, a lot of people are trying to figure out um, why is it that there are so many different voices within these protests, um, you know, in your time, it, some people may say it was more unified when it was one voice, but now there's so many different voices. So how are people supposed to really engage? Well, I think every voice needs to be heard. There was a time when there were a few people in a back room and they made all the decisions for us. Uh, when I was coming through, I was a young man such as Lawrence and I did not want to accept what they gave us uh, as consideration. I, I did not want to accept that. But I was supposed to be quiet because we got one black person on the sheriff department or one black person in the police department. Uh, we did not think that the standard organizations were going far enough. And so we refused to be silent. And in America, just as every person has a right to a weapon, we all have a right to be heard. And what this young man has done is he's coalesced all of these voices and he's created a platform where everybody wants to be heard. Uh, who's to say that he should speak for me when my child is at risk? Or who's to speak for my grandmother when her grandchild is at risk? All of these voices have to be heard. And so Lawrence has done an extraordinary job to be able to bring the NAACP to 5%ers, 3%ers. He's been able to bring the Antifa. He's been able to bring the Black Panthers, all of these people, we are thinking about the same problem, systemic racism. We're thinking about how our lives matter. And he's part of a movement that I thought I would never see. When National Geographic in Washington, D.C. took their five-story building and put up a billboard on that and said, Black Lives Matter. To be able to drive through Shandon and see signs in yards saying, Black Lives Matter to go in Georgetown in DC and see Black Lives Matter. I was in Seattle and we were, we were right outside of where all the protests in a nice white suburban community and see signs that says Black Lives Matter. The idea that we matter is beginning to be a major sticking point. But as we've seen with the president and with a whole lot of other white racist nationalists, as we've seen with the new Ku Klux Klan, there's some people who said our death matter. They want us to die economically. They want us to have the lowest paid job. They want us to be on the first line of COVID in the hospital. They want us to serve them, but they have no respect for our lives. We are just cannon fodder. We are just the, the ground that they tread on. But there young people like this standing up and said, no, our lives matter. And, and Lawrence, the, the beautiful thing about him, he's not profane, he's profound. He, 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 he has a soft voice, a tender heart, and he actually wants to appeal to people, let us live. He's like a new Moses. Instead of saying, let my people go, he's saying, let us live. And that's the only way America is going to be able to live in peace, is that we give, be given space to breathe. And to that, Lawrence, uh, we give you the final statement here, kind of wrapping things up. 
Um, how do you feel to Bishop's reaction? And then also, what do you tell people who would like to um, be an advocate? Um, you know, it's just like uh, Bishop said, it's more than one voice. Uh, with Black Lives Matter, we got people like Kyan Jones and Shanae Ryan and Demaya, 18-year-old college students uh, who are dealing with schoolwork, but also dealing with fighting for Black lives every day. Uh, we got those who have no jobs and they're still out here making sure that they show up at protests and that they give their all to make sure that Black lives matter. Um, and to get involved either way, even during COVID right now, is to put our voices on the ballot. We can't make a change unless we have our voices on the ballot. So when November 3rd gets here, matter of fact, when October 4th gets here, go get your absentee ballots, get ready and just go vote. Um, and that's another way that we can make change. And for those who can't get out there to um, protest like they want to, um, that's another way to do it is by having our voices on the ballot. All right, Bishop Retford II and Lawrence Nathaniel, gentlemen, thank you so much for your opinions and your perspective um, to this matter. Um, thank you so much for joining us.